Hello, fellow travelers, and welcome to the First in the Stars podcast. How my loyal listeners? Thank you for your continued support. And remember, click that subscribe button, everybody. It's an amazing episode because Robert Venditti returns to the mothership. You know him as the writer of Green Lantern and Hawkman. He now writes Superman 78 and Escape from Wyoming. Now join us as we go traversing the stars. Hello, Mr. Venditti. Thank you so much for coming to the First in the Stars podcast. Yeah, thanks for having me back, Jeff. It's totally my pleasure. You're one of my favorite guests of all time, and I want to thank you coming, uh, get to interview for the fourth time, which is fantastic. <laughs> thanks for the kind words. I appreciate it. Oh, it's totally my pleasure. You are, like I said, every, we interview, I talk to you every year around this time, and it's, yeah. it's become my lucky charm so far. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, you're the writer for Superman 78 right now. How does it feel to be the custodian of the character's most iconic portrayal? Uh, yeah, I mean... Superman, that version of Superman, as I've probably talked about in earlier uh, interviews on the show, I didn't grow up reading comics. Sort of my introduction to the idea of superheroes was the Christopher Reeve Superman. Um, probably Superman 2 is what I remember seeing in the theater more uh, than the original movie. But for me, that has always been the definitive version of Superman. I think even if you see me write Superman, that's more of like DC continuity. I still skew towards that uh that version of the character so um when andrew marino the editor on the book reached out to me about you know kind of pitching for the series um you know he knew my background we'd done a ton of books together green lantern hawkman freedom fighters all kinds of stuff and he knew my background that this was my version of superman you know and so uh you know, I, I came up with the ideas that we had and they said they wanted to use Brainiac. And so that was kind of the lead they gave me. And I, I went from there. Um, but it's amazing to be able to work on that specific version of the character, because like you say, that's like probably globally, like that is the definitive version of Superman. And there's never really been comics uh, from those films and the way that we're doing them now, you know uh so it's it's a joy to work on super proud of how the first series came out and uh i've already written the second series so there'll be more news on that pretty soon i think one of the coolest things about the series is that as you said the villain is brainiac and i think of all the superman villains that have not seen a film version brainiac is that one that one's like how is this guy not already in one of the movies yeah i mean i think richard donner was building towards that if i understand my sort of lore of the donna reeve films you know but then he left the franchise uh before he was able to complete that vision so it was something that was kind of always a little bit unfinished i didn't know any of that when i started writing it i didn't know that more i, I know a bit more about it now because i've interacted more with the superman you know reeve donner film sort of fan community you know mm. Uh, so I know a bit more about the lore than I used to, but yeah, I think, um, you know, Brainiac was not his choice for reasons you said. Uh, I think, I think if I was to sit down with a blank slate and do a film about one of two characters, it would be Brainiac or Zod, if it comes mm. to, you know, um, but, uh, I think there's some others that we haven't necessarily seen, uh, film versions of yet. Um, you know, we've got ideas, we've got the second story and then we've got ideas for some additional ones too. So um hopefully we'll continue to be able to work in that universe because uh it's a great gig you know even beyond just loving writing that version of the character it's also like its own thing you know so we have a chance to build our own continuity and do some things with the story that you wouldn't be able to do in the comics and and i really tried to sit down and think about you know why donner made certain choices to include include certain characters and certain scenes and would he have had a larger plan for those across the franchise and what might that plan have been? And, um, so it's a lot of fun to work with those things. Now, are you hinting at some of the characters we're going to see in the second um, series for villains or? Yeah. So the villain of the second series, uh, I won't say who it is, but I think it's a villain that we haven't seen in film before. 
I don't want to swear that there's never been a TV version of it, but also there's been TV versions of Brainiac, so I don't think that's what you're asking. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, but even with other characters like like uh, Jor-El and Lara, you know, it seemed to me that Donner spent so much time with those versions of the characters in Superman One and Superman Two that to just have them exit the franchise would have seemed strange to me, you know. So. I thought about what would the plan, what could a plan have been, you know, and how could that plan tie in with the villain that we're going to use for this series, which is Brainiac. And that's where some of the storyline ideas came from with, you know, Superman being trapped inside the bottle city of Candor and reuniting with Lara and Jor-El and having to make a choice and all those kinds of things. That's stuff you couldn't do in the comics, you know, but in a, in a job like this, um, you're freed up to to take those kind of chances and do those kinds of things. And I think it's fantastic that you do give more um, room to Lana. I feel like in the movies, Jarrell gets all the oxygen and Lana gets kind of pushed to the side a little bit. And it's good that you gave her more things to do. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, in the films, we really just kind of see the Krypton explosion scene and he does interact. Superman does interact with Laura through the, I don't know, crystal, I don't know, uh, hologram kind of of her, right, right. Or whatever, you know, and has some conversations with her and things. And um, that was what I based her character on when I was writing her. Uh, but just to work with any of those characters, you know, the, the Brando version of Jor-El and uh, the Hackman version of Lex Luthor, which I, I feel is very different from the comic version of mm. Lex, Luthor, Lex Luthor, you know. So just to be able to work with those versions of the characters, you know, that Perry White, you know, Margot Kidd or Lois Lane, that Jimmy Olsen, you know, all that stuff. So um, it's just something you would never get a chance to do anywhere else. And nobody's ever had a chance to do it before, you know. Mm. So how often do you get to say that you've written something that no one, in comics, you know, DC comics, that you've written something that no one's written before, especially something like this. It's been around, you know, 40 years. Uh, so going on 40 years. So. And I think the, the other great thing is that you really, I think, nailed the essence of Superman, not just the Christopher Reeve Superman, but I think Superman in general. And there's there's a, a line of dialogue that um, you have in the sixth issue of Superman 78 when Superman is fighting uh, Brainiac and he says, I'm not better than anyone. I just believe everyone deserves a second chance. I think that kind of distills the character to like his very essence. So can you kind of give us how you use that line in the dialogue to really get to like the heart of who he is? Yeah, just my thinking of Superman you know, I, I think there's definitely that group of people who thinks that the concept of Superman is is hokey or outdated, you know, and they feel a need to do darker versions of it mm. and things like that. But to me, I don't find that somebody doing the right thing because it's the right thing to do or somebody always trying to find the best in people. I don't find that to be hokey, you know, mm. like I find that actually pretty honest and um it's it's certainly how i try to be you know i try to think the best of people and you know there's another line in the book somewhere that i think um uh, sums it up you know pretty well and he's like you know i came from another planet and the first two people i met took me in and loved me as their own like how could mm -hmm. i not see good in people you know and um, I think it just gets to the core of his character, whether I was writing him in the comic books or in the films or whatever. I just think that Christopher Reeve was able to portray that in such a way on film that even if you watch that film now, it's, it's what Superman 78, it's 44 years old, I guess, right? If you watch that film now, I honestly don't believe it feels hokey. I think it feels inspiring and, and good and decent and um, aspirational which I think is something that DC characters are, are it's, it's what draws me to DC characters is the aspirational nature of them, you know? And uh, I don't know, I just, I just find all that stuff. It's kind of how I try to be myself. And so it's not hard for me to write that way. I, I think I'd be a terrible Batman writer because <laughs> you know? that's just not how I'm wired, you know? And, and that's okay. Uh, that's just how it is, you know? But, but I will say, I mean, I, I, as a fan who is, you know, I'm a big fan of Batman, I would like to see it 
the character toned down a little bit closer like to the 70s batman early 80s batman versus the over, overly overly dark batman that we currently have it seems like yeah i mean i don't have any kind of great batman reading history you know i haven't read a ton of batman or whatever but um i think certainly with the films they've gotten dark over time and i say that as somebody who went and saw the dark knight in theater i was really blown away by it the performances mm-hmm. in that film and the structure of that film the way it worked out i was like they did it they made a completely believable superhero movie you know mm-hmm. but i think if i was going to pick one or the other i would pick the tim burton you know jack nicholson michael keaton characters to me because i think it, there is supposed to be an element of fun and an element of whimsy and i think that's something that the batman the animated series did so well you know with their treatment of characters like the mad hatter or scarface or things like that you know there was always even the way the joker was portrayed in the animated series you know there was always a, a lightness and a whimsy to it um that i find sometimes is lacking in those stories and the thing that i find odd is when you when you make superman when you try to do a darker version of superman right because the reason why superman works and the reason why batman works is because one's the dark and one's the light right and so they're opposites of each other and that's what makes them when they're together stand out when you go to make superman darker well then by necessity you have to make batman darker mm. so that the opposition is still there because if you make Superman darker and leave Batman where he is, well, now you got the same character. Right. So I think as there's a trend to make Superman darker as a character, Batman just has to keep getting much, 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 much darker <laughs> so that there's still that spread between them, you know? Right. And um, I, don't, I just don't know why you need to do that. You know, you can, Superman doesn't have to be dark. He works because he's not dark. Um, that's sort of baked into the concept of him in the same way that, Batman wouldn't work if he was like a happy-go-lucky guy, right? Like, right, right. <laughs> darkness is baked into the concept, and so why try to break those things? You know. Now, do you think the trend for Superman getting going darker is that the audience is becoming more cynical, or do the publishers, or let's say the executives, are more cynical in how they think the audience has become? <sighs> I don't know. It's a good question. Um, I don't know, maybe a little bit of both, you know, and I think that um, it, it might be an effort to make it more real world, you know, and more modern day and that kind of thing. Um, I don't know if I can say, you know, and, and in my, my experience at DC, all the years that I worked there, um, you know, primarily the end of the new 52 and then the whole rebirth era was really when I was heavily plugged in and doing a lot of books there and reading Superman every month and all that kind of stuff. I'm trying to think, I don't recall there being like a dark version of the character in the Mm. comics. You know, I don't, I loved what Tomasi did with his Superman run. I don't recall that. I loved Jurgens' stuff on action. I don't recall him doing that. So I don't know if there's a specific version of the character that you're thinking of comic-wise. Film-wise, I definitely think. Oh, I'm thinking film, been, um, Cavill. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Film-wise, there's definitely been, you know, I haven't seen Black Enemy and I don't know what happens there. But the film-wise, yeah, there's definitely been a version to make him darker. I mean, uh, it seemed like an effort to make him darker. But I think also, I don't know. I think that's also maybe Zack, Zack Snyder's aesthetic. You know what I mean? Mm. So I don't... I don't fault him necessarily for coming in and making a darker version of Superman because what else, what you hired him <laughs> like you know what right. he does you know what I'm saying? Like, so like that's his storytelling and, and I, he's done films that I enjoyed you know um, it's just not and I, and people enjoy those films that's fine it's just that my version of Superman and it's not how I would choose to do those stories for me it's much more the Christopher Reeve version of it uh, than the Henry. Cavill version of it. Well, I really do think you did a a fantastic job with your Superman uh, 78 series. And I think another great aspect of what you did with the character of Superman is that you had Superman recognize a psychological weakness in Brainiac by having him point out what Brainiac's true motivation is, that he's not doing it for any kind of altruistic reasons, that he does have these darker intentions. Do you think Superman is often overlooked as being a highly intellectual character or that he leans so much on the strength of Superman and not 
that he really is one of the smartest characters as well in all of DC. Yeah, I think there can be um, certainly a. I think writers can fall into a trap of just trying to find the next big thing that he has to punch. You know what yeah. I mean? Um, and it is hard because he is super powerful. So, like, how do you create like true threats? You know, and like when I worked on the Man of Tomorrow series, which were individual self-contained stories that I did, um, they ended up a lot of them going di- on, up on digital because I had them in the, I had them banked. And then COVID happened. And so when all the printing presses were shut down, DC ended up putting a lot of them up on digital. And there's a collection of them now, but I really tried to come up with things that would test him in a way that he couldn't just punch his way out of, you mm. know, um, because he is intelligent. I wouldn't say he's, you know, you know, a Reed, Reed Richards level genius or like, you know, Mr. Terrific or anything like that. But I would say that he's uh, very plugged into, um, people's emotions and people's behaviors like i don't know emotional intelligence maybe you know what i'm saying right, right. um I, I do think that's something that he's able to dig into and again i would say that in the Don, the donna reeve films there was an element of that with superman and clark kent as well in the way they were portrayed mm. um, there was just a, this incredible earnestness that uh, christopher reeve was able to portray on screen that you just believed it, you know, and it made you feel warm and it it didn't seem hokey. And uh, certainly try to bring that across in the comic. And so much of it is the way the Christopher Reeve, you know, even acted body language, you know, and slumped shoulders and straight posture when he's Superman and his arms would swing when he's Clark Kent, things like that, you know, pushing his glasses up his nose and working with Wilfredo Torres on the story. He was able to capture that body language so well even like the feel of the swing of the arms in, a, in what is a static, a medium of static imagery, right? right. Being really able to capture that acting and um, Wilfredo, just a phenomenal talent uh, with just as much of a love for these versions of the characters that I do. I feel like that really comes across in the story, you know, and in the art mm. and how much it, it really does feel like to me, you know, when I read it, it really does feel like the next a third movie you know in, in my head it's set between superman 2 and superman 3 so it really does feel like a third movie to me and so much of that is wilfredo and the way that he's able to to handle those things you know now when you say superman 2 it's if we do superman 2 as we understand it or when they did the richard donner superman 2 cut that came out not too many i think a couple of decades ago yeah so a lot of people have asked me about that i i've not seen the donner cut um <laughs> And that was on purpose. Like I'd never seen it before. When I sat down with this job, I went and watched all the original movies and I watched Supergirl. But I didn't watch the Donner Cut version because I wanted to adhere, because this version of the character is so ubiquitous, the, the version that people know is the Superman 2 film that was in theaters. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? They don't know the Donner Cut. So I didn't want to go in and dig things out from the Donner Cut and whatever. I wanted to stick with what people saw in the theaters because the intent of this book is for it to be a comic, but it's a continuation of that theater universe, you know? So Mm -hmm. I still haven't seen the Donner cut. I'm sure I will at some point. Um, But for right now, I wouldn't want it to accidentally inform uh, the writing that I'm doing. Mm. Now, I think another great thing, uh, once again, going back to uh, Superman and Brainiac is that as the conflict, you kind of position them as avatars of optimism versus pessimism with Superman being the optimistic one and, and basically Burnett being a creature of a, a very pessimistic viewpoint, has, in your opinion, has that always been the aspect of their conflict or did you, in, in kind of deriving what you were gonna do with these characters, you decided that that's kind of what they stood for? I'll be honest, I haven't done a lot with Brainiac in the comics. I don't know that I've read many Brainiac stories. I don't know a ton about Brainiac in the comics, you know, and that was another nice thing about it. I didn't have to do the comic book version of Brainiac. I just had to do what would the film version of Brainiac be, you know? Mm. So uh, I didn't uh, delve into that too much. There were things that I wanted to do in terms of, I knew there were the, you know, sort of these two most popular versions of the character, you know, the the green skin with the electrodes on, on his head. And then also like the robot skull version, you know what I mean? And so I wanted to, this is a film, so I can use both versions of that character and, we sort of had the skull robot version looking Brainiac be drones so that you could have that visual. 
and then have the green skin electrode version as the guy behind the drones, you know? So we did fun things like that, but um, I didn't really dig too much into, you know, who Brainiac has been in the comics. I, I don't think I've ever written Brainiac in the comics. I don't believe I have. Um, mm. So yeah, this hasn't come up. You know, like, again, I say again, my background in comics, I started pretty late in life. I'm not super steeped in continuities, which I think can help me in a lot of ways because I don't come into a story with all these deep continuities and knowledge. You know, I, I come at it with a fresh take and uh, I think that served me well, um, whether it's something like Hawkman uh, or Green Lantern or, you know, things like that. With this version, with Superman 78, that was definitely the most continuity knowledgeable I've ever been about something that I've worked on because it's only the four films and I'd seen them already you know <laughs> so it, it, it isn't like you have to go back and start at action comics number one you know what I mean um so I was able to do the research in that way you know for for our listeners um the, the hardcover of Superman 78 has come out uh what kind of stuff could our listeners uh, find in the hardcover beyond the six issue is there like special things at the end yeah there's some uh cover sketches and I mean um all the variant covers are in there, including like one we did for Motor City Comic Con this year that Wilfredo did. Uh, I say we like I drew it, <laughs> a variant cover that Wilfredo did. And um, uh, there's also, I believe, some of the process stuff in the back where you see some of the early designs, you know, for Wilfredo and how he's designed these characters, particularly Brainiac. You know, Brainiac was super interesting because, you know, so many famous actors and actresses are in the films. And I wish I'd thought of it, but it didn't occur to me. It was all Wilfredo. When he sat down to think about who would have played Brainiac on screen and he came up with David Bowie, that was his genius. And I'm a huge David Bowie fan. You know, I, I'm just a tremendous admirer of, of not just of his music, but um, of how he handled his career and was able to do so many different things and change and, and reinvent himself so many times, you know? Um, so yeah, like you'll see some of that stuff in the back of it, you know? Mm. So in the next series, as you mentioned, for Superman 78, uh, volume two coming out, which aspects of Superman are you going to explore in the second series? Not necessarily the villains, but of his character. Yeah, I don't know if I want to get into any of that yet. Because I think if I did, it would probably give away who the villain is. You know what I'm saying? Ooh, okay. So uh, I think I'll keep, I'll keep that uh, tight-lipped for now. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely no problem. Um, another project that you're working on that, um, that's very cool is for bad idea comic books called escape from wyoming so mm -hmm. what inspired the creation of the series yeah so i do a ton of stuff for bad idea um uh they're a great company to work with it's a lot of the people i used to work with when i was a valiant and uh they're just real outside the box and i'm able to do some stories there um that i don't think i would be able to do anywhere else you know they're very open to things um they had this idea that they came to me with about uh you know an alien prison uh buried beneath Wyoming just kind of that one sentence you know and uh I built the story out from there but it's been a tremendous amount of fun to work on uh Jorge Monlongo is the artist who I hadn't worked with before but uh it's just gorgeous stuff you know and so much fun it's a much lighter um I would say humorous style of story uh than you would have seen me do it it you know somebody who's a fan of my DC work or my Valiant work or things like that um but uh, it's a three issue miniseries the first issue uh, just came out last Wednesday, I believe. It's only a week old. So uh, if you've got a bad idea store near you, you can get it. If not, there's a bunch of bad idea stores that do mailings. And you can get it there as well. And uh, they really put out high quality stuff. The stories are good, but they also have really nice production values. Um, and each issue also comes with a backup story too. So it's a lot of content in each issue. So Now you described Escape from Wyoming. Um, th this is a quote from you. Science fiction, Western, action, comedy, crime, adventure, that's something for everyone. Okay, that's a lot of descriptors right there. Uh, how have you managed to mesh uh, one, two, three, four, five different genres all into one comic book? Yeah, so I, I see you see my, uh, my video that we did to promote I, it. Yeah, yeah, we're going to talk about that in a second. That's that was <laughs> great. Um, so obviously the video is, is uh, fun and I'm poking fun at myself and everything like that. But um, it is true. You know, the concept of Escape from Wyoming is that there's an alien prison buried beneath Wyoming uh, for the galaxy's worst criminals. And, you know, it's kind of like Earth is the bad neighborhood of the galaxy, you know, so they put the prisoners here and some of the prisoners escape. And there's a cop who's in the alien prison that was uh, framed and convicted. And so 
uh, the warden lets him out and says, you know, you have a certain amount of time to go get these prisoners and, and bring them back to prison or make sure they don't get off the planet or the safety measures that the, the planet's going to explode. So uh, he, he does that. And in doing that, he ends up teaming up with the sheriff in this small town in Wyoming. And so you had, you definitely have, you know, the sci-fi, you have the comedy, you have the crime, you have the adventure, you have the Western, all that stuff is in there. So that's part of what made it so fun is it isn't just this genre, you know, it's just really blending a bunch of things together um, that I love to read and I love to watch. And um, in some cases have never had a chance to write. So um, it's fun. It's fun to work on projects like that. I mean, the comic book sounds absolutely awesome, but as, as you mentioned, what I really enjoyed was that promotional video that you did uh, that, that, that you put yourself in. So how much fun was that um, to do that video? And why, why don't you think that more publishers don't do this with their videos and have their, their team? Uh, as, for those who may not know, it, please check out the promotion. It is awesome. Uh, they, they, they literally put you in the video um, they, with some animation around you. And it's this really funny, cool video. So what was that experience like? Whose idea was it? And why do I think more uh, publishers aren't trying to do that? Well, it started with uh, the first series I did for Bad Idea called Tankers. And when I was doing this series called Tankers, which is sort of a very muscled, you know, tongue in cheek story about these mercenaries that wear giant mech suits and go back in time to divert the comet to kill the dinosaur. Because if the dinosaurs live longer, then there'll be more oil in the present. And we won't run out of gas. Right. And so, um, when I was doing, when I had written that series and it was getting close to being announced, there's a place near me, uh, near me over an hour away, but in Georgia called Tank Town, where you can go and you can actually drive a tank and you can shoot like a machine gun and do all these things. And so I told them this and I was like, you know, I can do a video there and like we can do something really funny. And they were really supportive and they were into it. And they were like, yeah, you know. And so one of my very best friends is a guy named Brockton McKinney. He's done comic work, but he also does a lot of film work and a lot of film editing. And so he and I really came up with the idea for the video. He was sitting there when I mentioned to him this tank place and he was like, are you serious? And we just started talking about what we could do, you know? So this video is sort of a continuation of doing those humorous videos. Brock came in again and it was like, you know, what can we do? And, uh, you know, all the effects and everything, that's all him. And um, he went and actually edited the whole thing together and added all the effects and then showed it to me. And then I wrote all the lines based off what he had already done, you know, and um, bad idea is just super outside the box and supportive about those things, not just in this aspect, but you're outside the box in the stories they tell and their publishing model, their sales model, like really in a lot of ways. And so um, it's something that feels, I think it fits, I think the, the brand identity of the company, you know, mm. um, as far as other publishers, I don't know. I mean, I think, first of all, you'd have to have um, a writer who wants, doesn't mind making an idiot of <laughs> <laughs> uh, But to me, it's fun. You know, like I realize people are probably going to, I don't know, look at that and say, this doesn't look like something a guy that would win an Eisner would do. You know what I mean? But I, it's just not, I don't know. It's fun. You know, like mm. I try not to take myself overly seriously about those things. I take the stories seriously and I take the work seriously. And I really do try to think about character and theme like that. But as far as being able to do this for a living, like it's kind of inconceivable to me, right? Like I don't come from a family where this would have been a, a viable career opportunity. I don't know anybody that did any, it was in the arts in any capacity. Right, right. Um, so to be able to do this for a living, it's just a real joy. And I don't know, I, I, I don't mind doing some things that people are going to see on social and and get some laughter out of them and get some joy out of them because that first one the tank when we did i mean that thing took off like wildfire because I, I i'm a pretty quiet person when you meet me in real life i'm pretty reserved and like the idea like i didn't tell anybody we were doing it you know we just posted online and some of my best friends that i've known the longest saw it and were like i cannot believe they got you to do this. And I was like, no, it was my idea. You know, like Brock and I, we came up with this whole thing ourselves. And um, I mean, bad idea definitely came in and uh, helped us with the video, you know, afterwards. And Josh Johns, who works for Bad Idea, who handles a lot of their social media marketing and things, 
he came in and worked on the video with us. But as far as like, it wasn't like they came to us and had to convince us to do it. You know, we went to them and they were like, are you serious? You know, um, and they were happy to do it. But um, I don't know. I just think it's fun. And um, I don't know. Let's just have some fun sometimes. You know, the, the world can, play, can be pretty dark. So uh, why not try to lighten it up when you can? You know? I, mean, I, mean, I was going to say, I mean, um, to say that what writers would or would not do it, I to me, when I watched it, it just looked like a guy having a great time. It made it, the comic book look a lot of fun. And I must admit, I just thought it was cool. I, I thought it was, a, it was a very cool thing to do. <laughs> I appreciate it. You have a kinder view of it than my children do. <laughs> Their response is, you're not going to, nobody I know is going to see this, are they? <laughs> <laughs> so um, just going back to the story a little bit, um, the small town sheriff is named um, Loden Holiday. Am I saying the last name? Uh, the first Loudon. name, right? Loudon. Loudon, uh, Loudon Holiday. Um, and he's part of, has to deal with the escape inmates from the underground prison. So how equipped is he to deal with the situation? And was he pre prepared for this potential happenstance that this could be something he has to deal with? No, he has no idea that there's an alien prison buried under Wyoming, you know? And the concept is that the reason why Yellowstone Park is a national park uh, is because back in the days of Lincoln, the aliens came here and said, we're gonna put a prison here. Where do you wanna put it? And Nixon, I mean, um, Nixon, <laughs> Lincoln agreed to this, but Grant is the one who created Yellowstone National Park as a, as a thing, and it was the country's first national park. And so the concept is that when Grant became president, he sort of inherited this. And was like, what do we do? And he put it under the park. And the reason why the park's there and you can't build there is because nobody wants you to find out there's a prison there. <laughs> the sheriff has no idea. When they escape, he has no idea what's going on. There's no idea about any of it. That's part of his journey for the story, you know, where he starts out and where he ends, you know. Uh, Two, two very different people in a short span of time because once the prisoners escape, it's only 90 Earth minutes until the planet explodes. So the whole story takes place for the most part within those 90 minutes. That's very cool. And like I said, the, another character is the character Dunn. Um, the summary states that he's betrayed by the corrupt system he served. So was Dunn aware that the system was corrupt at the time? Is, he, is this betrayal tragic or a comeuppance? Uh, he was a true believer. You know, he comes from a family of police officers and he believed in the law. And when he got framed and sent up uh, to super maximum Earth, uh, the worst prison in the galaxy, um, it sort of crushed his view of the law and sort of the ethics that he had always tried to uphold, which was to be right and just. And so now he spent, by the time the story takes place, he spent five years in prison with 399 of the worst criminals in the galaxy. And now his view of the law is very different. You know, um, he's at the point now where the law is, he, he almost feels like he is the law. Like he's the mm -hmm. one true policeman, you know? And uh, he has some score to settle too, some scores to settle as well. Um, whether or not those things come along uh, will depend on if we do a second story and who knows <laughs> maybe we will. So, so how does Dunn and Holiday interact with each other? It, like, what, what is that relationship like? Originally, you know, Holiday has no idea what this thing is, and he shoots him, you know. <laughs> uh, but, and then Dunn, you know, he has, um, I would almost say, disdain for this earthy cop that doesn't even know about this prison and is way out of his league with, with these, you know, intergalactic criminals, you know. Um, so he almost dismisses him, but they find out that they're both going to need to work together in order to accomplish what they need to accomplish in such a short amount of time. And I also don't want to forget about Moose the dog, which is uh, Loudon Holiday's bloodhound, uh, who is also instrumental in the story and uh, is always there uh, to give Sheriff Holiday uh, some help when he needs it, you know. It's, it's just something, a, a, a story that's a lot of fun, like, like a good old school fun comic book. Yeah, no, it's just... It's enjoyable. It's a self-contained story. Um, it's three issues, but they're all, you know, well, let's see, the first one's 36 pages, I think. And the other ones are 24, you know? Um, so it's a lot of content. And Malongo actually is able to put a ton of content into each individual page. He's got some pages that have like 20 panels on them, you know? <laughs> so uh, it's a lot of story and uh, it's a lot of fun to work on. And like I say, it's it's something... You know, this big genre mashup, you know, type thing that we're doing. It's something I don't feel like you get a lot of 
in comics. It's certainly something that I've never really had an opportunity to do because most of my work has been at DC and it all kind of mm. falls into that superhero genre in some way or another, you know? And, um, so, yeah. So the, you said the first issue probably just came out. When is it going to be come out every month for issues two and three? Yeah. So it'll be the first Wednesday. I believe it's the first Wednesday of every month. So the first Wednesday in October, whatever that is, and the first Wednesday, uh, the first Wednesday in October was when the first one came out. No, wait, what is it? The first Wednesday in November was when the first one came out. So it'll be the first Wednesday in December and the first Wednesday in January. Well, like I said, Escape from Wayne looks very cool. It sounds very cool. And I look forward to reading all the issues. Thank you so much, Mr. Venditti. Yeah, no, I appreciate it. Thank you, Jeff. Always happy to be You too. You, uh, this one says it's a pleasure as always to speak with you. Have a fantastic night.